All right, we are live. Cool. Okay. With that. Excellent. So fire up a copy of uh, Adam and uh, now we're going to head over and then uh, open up a browser tab. We're going to go back and we're going to download a copy of the boilerplate. So you punch in H5VP into your search engine. Top hit should be H5BP. And the top one here, it's called HTML5 boilerplate. That should be the top repository in GitHub. So make sure this is the one that you have you uh, you have in front of you in GitHub. So I want the H5BP slash HTML5 dash boilerplate. So pull that up in your in your browser right now. Okay. And we're going to download the zip file. I'll put this into my documents. Put anywhere. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna put. We're gonna pull. We're just gonna pull this one down. Uh, I guess it's not that different, but it. Yeah, if you if you want to work, if you want to continue, if you if you didn't blow that away or you didn't throw it in some crazy folder, if you still got what you were working on last week. That's cool. Um, yeah, but uh, or a fresh one's fine. So I'll pull down a fresh one here. Uh, new folder, week one. And extract all of this stuff. Okay, so now we've got the zip file and we've extracted it. Make sure in Windows you extract all of those files because it's very tempting to uh, uh, open up files that are compressed. It's not. It's a bad idea. So I'm going to throw the zip in the trash. <coughs> So it kind of doubles up the HTML5 boilerplate master. So then we go into our code editor. And we're going to add a new project, add a project folder. I mean, you may already have it. So we're interested in the source. So all the other stuff is uh, just like any other repository. It has the GitHub um, and the various other uh, assets in there. If, but we want to go to the source file, so in, inside SRC. And we're looking at index.html. So fire that up. I'll boost this up. I'll close my GitHub panel for now. Is that okay? Can you see that back at the, the very back? That's big enough? It's good? All right. So let's add a, a helpful title. Of, make sure that there's a language attribute in there. If you've got last week's file, we changed that to English. Always make sure you define the base language. Um, we've got our character encoding. They they suggest using the kind of uh, the empty elements without the slash inside. I don't like that. It is what it is. Um, as long as you're consistent. Um, we call this a uh, H HTM a useful title always description. That's a good idea.
Um, viewport. That's a good idea. The, the character encoding really needs to be set first. Um, uh, and, and certainly the, um, because as soon as the browser hits that, it has to reparse the page. So consider hitting, uh, pushing that up first. Um, this here, we talked about this. This one forces older versions of Internet Explorer to render in the most current rendering mode. Okay, so if you've got an older version of IE, um, uh, then this is this sets the uh, rendering mode to edge. Um, this will soon go away, right? But for now, if we're still dealing with legacy IE, it's, it's a good idea. Um, maybe in a year it might go away. Uh, so the viewport, that's very important for mobile, right? Does my soft wrap work today? I always wrestle with soft soft wrap. I don't know why. No, it's working okay. All right. Um, so we're going to open up the same file. Save that. We're going to open up the same file just locally in your browser. So open up a tab, Control O, and we'll take a look at. inside the source and we want the index.html template. So there we go. Um, let's uh, add uh, a bit of content. So we'll head down here. So inside the body, uh, oh, we have, we have our normalize CSS, our link to normalize, our link to main.css. So we normalize first. Always before you add your own styles, right? If you normal, if you add your own custom styles to your application and then normalize afterwards, that's like putting the paint color on the wall and then putting primer on afterwards. The primer goes on first, then your paint color, right? So think of normalize like paint primer. It, it, pre it preps the wall for for all. Just make sure your styles are are rendered consistently across all your browsers. Um, that's great. There's a, and these are called uh, uh, um, Microsoft conditional comments. So these comments are ignored by all other browsers except for IE. And then IE will look at this condition and say, if this browser is less than or equal to LTE, this is completely proprietary code that belongs to Microsoft. No other browser cares or even, ben even pays any attention to this. But IE will say, oh, is the user agent less than or equal to IE9? If that's the case, this, this paragraph actually gets rendered on the page. And it says to the user, hey, you've got a dusty old browser. Update your machine, man. That's a mess. Right? That's cool. Um, so the nice thing, though, because this is all rendered in just plain old HTML comments, all other modern browsers ignore all of this stuff. It was, it was a really, really kind of neat technology that the Microsoft team developed. Um, OK, let's. Uh, so now we get to the point, after all that other stuff, we can actually put our content in. So this is where, in our, when we're building a template for an application or a CMS, this is where we would output that HTML comment, content. So let's add an H1 here. HTML5 wait. H1. And I'm going to put a horizontal rule in here too, an HR. We'll just add those two little bits of code in there. If I refresh the page, um, what you'll actually see here is the that the um, uh, the HR here. If you uh, the default rendering for a horizontal rule um, is is kind of like that faux three D stuff where it kind of has like little shadowing. It looks like it's kind of indented in the page. Uh, the 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 styles um, the styles here. If we go into the main.css that's included in the CSS directory, so there. Um, this is where they've uh, beyond the normalization. They've included some some sensible defaults. So or some what they call opinionated defaults. That's where like the team is like this is the way we think a page should render and some things should visually behave, right? For good practice. So they changed the HTML, the base color of the fonts to kind of a soft gray rather than black. Set a, a font size on the on the root out the root node, and set the line height to 1.4. So the letting. So 
space out the words. That's that's good. I, I like that. Um, they they also get rid of uh, there's text shadowing on when you select sometimes when you select um, text on a browser you may see there's a little bit of text shadowing on the, apparently that can cause people some real visual problems so they null that out. Um, here you can see the HR it gets displayed as a block level element instead of uh, maybe it's inline uh, so it, it they they style this HR element differently than the default style so that means and that helps. For example, HRs might look different on Mozilla Firefox or, or iOS, um, uh, iOS Safari Mobile, or, or who knows, or, or Opera on a Windows 10 machine, right? So that just that kind of uh, kind of levels the field. Things like uh, vertical, and so there's some obviously some rendering weirdness across these uh, media elements, and that this sort of um, makes more consistent field sets, text areas. Um, they style the browser upgrade if that thing is rendered. Your own styles, when you're rendering, if you're using this boilerplate to create a template, this is where your stuff goes, right? So after those other things, you bolt it in here. So the comments are really, really well, well laid out. So your stuff goes in there. And then after your stuff, there's also a few other helper, helper classes so if you want something to be hidden uh, visually and from the screen readers, you can add some of these built-in classes like dot hidden. So I can say, um, I can go here and I can say um, to the HR, HR, for example, class equal hidden. Great. That'll hide that both visually and from screen readers. Um, there's other there's other classes here. Um, you can visually hide things, so maybe you want them to be red, um, but uh, not visually rendered, um, so on and so forth. Uh, hide visually and from screen readers, but maintain the layout. So maybe um, you you don't want to like re remove the space that they. Occupy, just hide them, right? Then you want visibility hidden rather than display none, so on and so forth. There's clear fix uh, for for if you're using floats and clears, you can you don't have to put in clear fix hacks. You can just simply put in uh, a dot clear fix um, class to a container that has floated children, and that will fix those float problems. With, um, so the the parent will then. Uh, automatic magically resize to contain all the children you won't get those float bugs on your on your layout so that's kind of nice a nice inclusion and there's some example media queries for responsive design so um, so these these are some suggestions um, and that's all they are um, to, for you to get started with um, some other there's some other helpers in here but again these are all what we call opinionated Default. So these these can certainly be overread, overwritten inside your code. Now, if we um, I'll reload the page here. Actually, I'll take the um, I'll take off that. So I'll stop hiding this uh, HR. Um, what I do want to show, if we right click on the page and we go into inspect, this is Google Chrome on IS10. Um, You'll see um, up at the top right in the in the console, there's five errors, right? So there's already some problems here before we get going. Uh, the first one is it didn't it didn't find normalize.css, so we actually don't have a normalized page. Uh, when you download the uh, boilerplate, they include a link in your file. They they include it here. There it is. But if you look at this inside the CSS directory, it's not there. So you have to take care of those dependencies, and that's really important. When you start, when you start building all of the basic assets and bits and pieces to prepare to, to build a project, you have to make sure all of those file dependencies are in place. Are in place. Yeah. Did it, or was that the one that I provided through Blackboard? Oh. Yeah, then they provide it. Okay, so I pulled this from the repo. So yeah, in that case, they kindly did that. I, I have a feeling they did this for the repo because um, because normalized they don't want to 
that's not part of the repository. That's an external, that's a third party. And so if that has changes, they're not, they don't want to track and maintain, they're forking the normalized code. So I think that's why it's not here. So just, just be aware that if, um, you check it that it's there. <laughs> Make sure you have the normalized or you're going to get some real style weirdness. If you're assuming that normalized.css is there and it's not, you're going to get some weirdness. And you're like, why is this weird? I've normalized everything. In my case, I haven't. You have. I have not, right? So um, I'll just go ahead and uh, open up a tab. If you've got it there, that's great. I think they're at version 8. Uh, where are we at? Download version 8. So you can click on, go to normalize, uh, Google up normalize.css if it's not there. Click on the big red download button. And what it does is it actually opens up normalize.css in your browser. Well, some browsers might prompt you to download it, but a lot of them will just say uh, you can view the code. Okay. Uh, I won't review uh, normalize. Um, we talked a little bit about this in COP 1054. Uh, but again, the, the idea between normalization is let's not blow away all the default styles in all the browsers. Let's just fix where things are a little bit different, right? Um, so where Firefox and IE differ on these things, let's kind of um, uh, set things straight. So just it, make sure all of the browsers present things visually consistently. But an H1 is still by default bigger than a subheading. So a heading is bigger than a subheading. You can change that. Your CSS, you don't overwrite this file. You write your own custom styles after you've normalized, right? So that's all good. Um, so I'll go uh, Control S or Command S on Mac. Let's save normalize.css. Let's put that in the source and put it in CSS. Save that right alongside. And watch this file when I now when I refresh this. Now, in case there's anything cached, when you have the, uh, the dev tools up and running, you can actually hold down the refresh button and you'll get some, you can do a, what's called a hard reload, or you can use those keyboard shortcuts. But a hard reload will flush the cache, so anything that's saved in memory, will flush that out. So if, you, if you've made a change and, and things are not changing, you're refreshing, do a hard reload, it might just blow it away, okay? So notice how the content now kind of slammed up against the side of the, a side of the window. That's a good indication, there's little changes there and then you're like, oh yeah, something's going on. Um, so if we look at normalize, uh, I'll tell you, I'll show you what's going on that, right? Remove the margin in all browsers. So, cause I guess margin and padding is kind of, or margins are maybe inconsistently. Uh, some browsers have uh, a margin X, some might have a margin Y. So there's a, some of them have more or less. This just says, blow it all away. I'm going to let you do the layout yourself. Okay. So, um, that's sensible. I, I like, I like the way they're thinking here. Cool. So, uh, that's good. Okay. Modernizer. I think this is where they, isn't where I was talking about modernizer. We're trying to, isn't that where the fire, the fire alarm fired up and I was like monkeying around. Okay. So, um, modernizer, uh, is a, a piece of JavaScript, but what this does is it doesn't actually affect or make your browser more modern. What it does is it says, uh, what is this user's browser capable of? What can it do? So it kind of spins through the capabilities. It's called capability detection, and it imparts a list at the top of the age inside the uh, inside the class attribute of the HTML, the root node. It builds a list and adds uh, a space separated list of all of the things that the browser is capable of doing. Right. So then you know, you with your CSS, um, you can target a browser element uh, if it's, say, if um, the thing can do SVG, you can style SVG things, but you can refer to a class name on the HTML. So you can say dot HTML dot um, SVG enabled, and then SVG and add styles, and you know the browsers that don't support SVG won't bother with those styles. So you can kind of like build, bake in some custom renderings or designs based on what the browser is capable of and leaving the other ones that can't do it to their own devices. So you, you, they don't try and add these styles. I'll show you how this works. So let's go to um, type in uh, 
modernizer without the er you should pull up modernizer.com and like we looked at last week you can you can add like you can check for maybe you just need to check and see that the uh, that the browser can render canvas maybe that's all you need to check maybe you just need to uh, know that the element or the browser can do HTML5 audio element so in case you maybe you've built a site that you no longer use the flash plugin for for streaming audio you need to make sure that this thing can do so you can do that or if we go back to the um, the, if you hit the development build, what this is, it just enables all of them. It's a bit, it's kind of overkill, but what it does is it, it allows you to, it basically checks for all of these things. Okay, so click on the, go, when you're on the homepage, click development build. This is like the full, the full enchilada. This is everything, right? And then hit build. And if you hit build, and we can just download that on the top right. And it will give you a custom modernizer-custom.js file. And we'll put that in right inside the source or the inside the source file and inside the JavaScript. Um, now be aware, um, we can't just put it right in with beside the other JavaScript files because this is a third party uh, piece of JavaScript. So what we're gonna do is create a new folder in here called vendor. And this is good practice, is to separate when you're using lots of JavaScript libraries to do things um, in a folder just for stuff you got elsewhere, right? For third party stuff, rather than we'll go in, add a new uh, folder called vendor inside the JavaScript, go in there and then save modernizer-custom.js. Cool. Now what we want to do is here, here we have, um, they've kind of got a, a placeholder here for online 28 or so, somewhere around there. Um, so you see they've already assumed that you're going to put the modernizer inside the vendor folder inside the JS. So um, make sure you spe spell vendor properly. It's not V-E-N-D-E-R, it's O-R. So make sure that's spelled. Watch your case. Don't put a capital V. It's all lowercase. Um, so we change this to, uh, and it's modernizer dash custom dot JS. So dash, and it's not minimized. Change that right in there for the script, the source attribute for the script element so that it points to the one we just pulled down in the vendor folder. Cool. Thanks very much. That's awesome. Now, before you refresh the page, I want you to look up here at the HTML, the root node, right in the with the, the dev tools open. Um, you see up there it says HTML class equal node.js. So there's one class in the class list for the HTML. When I hit refresh, that modernizer script is going to analyze your particular browser, and it's gonna put a list of things in there that your browser can do based on those tests. So I'll hit refresh, and you can see that list is huge. So remember, we, we ordered up from modernizer, the development build, so I checked for everything. This is basically everything a web app could ever want to do, right? So that is the entire, uh, class list. So the class JavaScript updates that class list. And because you're running JavaScript, we replace Node.js with JS because the browser can do JS because otherwise it could rewrite this, this DOM node. So it rewrites that and then it adds a space separated list of all of the features of your particular browser. Yours may be different than mine. That's Chrome, whatever, on Windows 10. Yours may be 
a slightly newer version, maybe slightly older. Maybe you're not using Chrome. You've got Mozilla fired up. So now we can, for example, of if I'm, uh, what's a good example here? Look, let's look at some of this stuff here. Um, you know, if I want to, um, if I want to use the canvas, and I want special CSS styling for canvas, but I don't want browsers that can't do canvas. I don't want them to read through all this CSS. So I can put dot canvas space canvas in my, or HTML dot canvas, canvas, maybe with an ID or class, and I can point to it. And so if that class is present in the root node, it will read that CSS. If it's not there, it won't bother because the browser can't do it. That's the benefit to modernizing. So it doesn't change the capability of your browser. It just re it just tries to determine what can your browser do, what what uh, features are enabled, and then puts a list in a class list inside your HTML. It's pretty huge, um, pretty capable browser. Uh, okay, jQuery. I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of kind of moving away from dependencies on code libraries, but for the time being, jQuery is here with us and it's here to stay for a while. Um, it's used for a lot of different things. It's it's a useful kind of friendly, uh, it's a, it's a friendly script library and it's um, it's easy to build pre-built, particularly things like animated interactions and things like that. They're quite they're quite smooth. And, um, so. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to download the most recent um, production. So you can pull this down from a what's called a CDN, code.jQuery.com. And uh, the, the only thing you have to, to be mindful of is um, your application now is going to a different domain to get a dependency. So it's going to code.jQuery.com in this case to get that jQuery. That's fine, but some browsers now uh, determine that to be a security problem, right? So you have to have something on your web app called uh, cores or uh, cross origin resource sharing. And if that's not enabled at the server level, then this may not be available and the user may, be, may get some sort of uh, security warning. And then you won't have the, the you won't have the ability to use that script. So that's why we have um, uh, that's why we, we also have a fallback because jQuery can be pretty uh, pretty important. There's a fallback here uh, if uh, window.jQuery doesn't produce anything, um, uh, then document.write and we actually write the script element to pull up a local copy. So let's do that. We'll pull up a local copy of jQuery. And just go into a tab, jQuery.com. And the top right, we'll just pull it down. J download jQuery version 331. And you can pull down the compressed production jQuery 331. And there it is. It actually pulls it up in your, for the most part. Does anyone get a download? I, I, got a, I get it pulled right up in the screen. So this is compressed. What happens is this is a piece of JavaScript, but they get rid of all the white space. So it's actually unreadable. That's what they mean by minimize. So it, it gets rid of all those new line characters and space characters. We save on space, so it kind of crunch it up so it comes out really fast. Minimized, okay? Um, obviously, working with minimized uh, JavaScript is no good if you're, you can minimize your own, own JavaScript, but make sure you uh, unminimize it before you do any editing on it. So that's cool. We'll, we'll go to control save, download that. And we'll go into up into the JS. Oh, it should be in the vendor too. Should be in vendor jQuery dat, and just leave the leave that file name jQuery dash 3.3. It's a good way, good idea to leave those uh, those numbers in there so that when you come back, you know what version because you may be using certain methods that are only available in that version of jQuery. So leave that in place. I'll put it in the vendor file beside modernizer. And there we go. So in this case, we're pulling from the vendor jQuery dash. And then I put the version in here. And it is 
3.3.1. It's really easy to mess this up. Just make absolute sure that matches this over here. So that's your fallback if we, uh, uh, if the, from the code, uh, this is called a content distribution network from the CDN. If that fails, you want to fall for jQuery. Um, yeah. CDNs. Um, the benefit to a CDN is very often, if you include uh, this here as a CDN, the benefit is that a lot of times there are a ton of web applications out there that ask for uh, jQuery and the, probably the current version from the from code.jQuery from their CDN or Google CDN. There's a ton of those. So what the benefit of doing that is there's a good chance the visitor comes to your application and they already have jQuery sitting in their browser cache. So that means you don't have to uh, you don't have to uh, suffer another hit to the bandwidth to pull it down. It, it just reuses what's in the cache, so it improves performance. That's the benefit of a CDN. One of the benefits. The other one is you don't have to maintain that code. Someone else is taking care of it for you while you sleep. There's that. So that's cool. We save that. Now we want to get the um, we want to get the uh, uh, the link or the source for the um, for the uh, CDN, the Content Distribution Network for jQuery. But I also want things like the uh, integrity uh, attributes. So what that does is it is it offers uh, a string in there, which it's sort of like a serial number, but it basically helps the browser verify the integrity of that uh, resource from the C CDN, so it knows that it can trust it. So it's not a piece of malicious code. Right, so that's really important. Security is is becoming more and more of, of an issue these days. I mean, um, I mean, for the first time, I've I've actually got now some antivirus running on my phone. Probably should have had it before now, but I'm like, man, now I got to put antivirus on my phone, really? And I've noticed a performance hit on my phone. I'm like, it never stops. Like, man. So yeah, we have to, th but we do have to think about uh, about it. Um, integrity we do have to think about um, uh, things like security so how does this work so let's go to I'll show you how this this uh, we get that that's um, here so if we go to um, is it on there? No. you go down scroll down the page it says using jQuery with a CDN So, for example, the jQuery CDN supports sub-resource integrity, which allows the browser to verify that the files being delivered have not been modified, read, tampered with, right? That's bad. So, uh, let's go down here. Uh, where is the, where is the J, oh, here. Uh, where's my jQuery, uh, I need to know my CDN. Oh, here it is. Uh, if you go to code.jquery.com, that's where the CDNs are. And let's grab the minified jQuery 3.x. So we click on that. And what it does is it, it actually brings up um, uh, a little, it actually builds out the script element for you, including the uh, URL to the, to the uh, code and the integrity. Yep. Where did I click that? So, okay, I'll go back again. It was kind of hidden. So, um, so this was the page we got uh, downloaded jQuery, right? Yeah. So if you scroll down, um, using jQuery with a CDN, it's about halfway down, a little past halfway down the page. Um, just under that, just before it says, other, there's a subheading called other CDNs. It says to see all available files and versions, visit uh, co HTTPS code.jQuery.com, hit on that. Oh, and this one, I uh, so I, I just took the most recent copy of three, jQuery 3.x, and I just grabbed the minified version. So click that, and it should bring up. And then you can copy the script element. For whatever reason, when I click the uh, copy to clipboard button, it doesn't work. I don't know why. Is anyone on a different platform with that uh, copy button to work? I have to manually copy the code and... Uh, 
that's fine. So, and then what I want to do here is then I want to replace the entire script element here and replace that with what I copied from code.jQuery.com. I'm going to format it a little bit. That's a weird line breaks. Whoa. So now we've got the, the URL to the, um, the, the version of jQuery that we want, which is the same as the one downloaded. It's minimized for speed. Um, have the integrity um, hash there. Um, and it notes that cross origin equal anonymous. Save that. And we'll go back and see. You can see all these errors here. I still have three errors. Refresh the page, and I should be clear of errors. Now, the only thing I, <laughs> the only thing I haven't been able to figure out is suddenly, um, for whatever reason, my uh, page stops rendering. Just stop. Has anyone else got a hidden rendering on the page, or is that just me? Yeah, your rendering just blows it away. I, I haven't been able to figure out why. Um, it it didn't rewrite the HTML, so there's your H1. Your HR, it's it's all still there, um, so I'm not really sure. I gotta track down that part, but um, it may also be part of the issue. May also be that we're looking at this locally instead of calling it up with HTTP. So, but we're gonna uh, after the break, uh, we're gonna start pushing this stuff up to um, to a server anyway. So we won't be doing this locally. Okay, so that's cool. Um, what I want to cover. So that's that's it. So this now what you've done here is you have a great starting point for a web application, right? If you're wondering where do I start, boilerplate's a good place to start because it's they've done in uh, they've done a lot of that thinking for you. You look at the source files. They've got some normalization and CSS, some main uh, sensible defaults for your styling. They've got jQuery and modernizer, so your, your app is already detecting the what the browser can do for you and outputting a list in your in your HTML node. Uh, jQuery, which is very common, is ready to go should you need it. Uh, uh, you know where you can put your uh, your JavaScript for your application. You put it in main.js, right? We know where you can put some styles in main.css down here. Um, in, under the author, author's custom styles. So this will save you a lot of headaches, right? It just kind of, like I said, it's like putting primer on the wall, prepping the wall before you do it, before you, you get going. Um, a lot of that thinking is done for you. Your 404 page, um, things like favorites icon, uh, humans.txt, which, which includes a list of people who may have worked on the project, for example, right? So kind of like movie credits. There's a there's a, a de facto standard for a text file, kind of like robots.txt. Your robots is there. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you want to turn uh, search engine bots away from certain directories, right? Like don't spider this. There's no point. It's just a waste of resources. Um, so and so forth. Tiles, tiles for um, for Windows uh, operating systems. And a manifest, a manifest, which is a piece of JSON, um, to uh, uh, for desktop operating systems like Windows, um, and uh, you might be using as as web applications become more capable and more like desktop applications, uh, you may be able to, able to engage the operating system in different ways with this uh, piece of JSON. Right, so it's a good start. Um, and a lot of really smart people work really hard for a long time, for years and years and years, to get figure out all these weird little bugs, right? And you are the beneficiaries of all that hard work. Thanks to open source software, you now can charge ahead and build web apps that work. You build once, and they work everywhere. And this is how you do it. Okay?
Cool. Uh, take a breather. Go and get yourself a coffee. Uh, we'll come back and we're going to get into the grid with Bootstrap. Let me just, uh, I'm going to just cancel the, uh, shut down the uh, screencast and then I'll.